in the mountains of Yellowstone, the balance of nature is being adjusted once again. Human eyes will closely watch this process, recording its effect on the elk and mule deer and grizzly. For this coyote, life will get harder, but the ravens and the eagles are already reaping benefits. For a vital element in the natural order of existence has been missing far too long. As the great land bridges that linked Asia to the Americas came and went, many species migrated between the old world and the new. Among the animals who made the journey eastward to North America were herds of muskox, caribou, elk, and buffalo. And following the herds, small bands of nomadic hunters and their kindred spirits, the wolf packs. primarily a hunter of large mammals. And on the vast Arctic tundra, the prey of choice is the muskox. An Arctic wolf pack may range over a thousand square miles to find sufficient food to survive. And locating their prey is just the beginning of a dangerous encounter that fails more often than it succeeds. Muskox are formidable creatures. They possess sharp hooves and curved horns, and a defensive formation almost impossible to breach. There is little chance for success in confronting them head on. As 
long as the herd remains together, it is secure. For the wolf pack, the plan is simple. They must get the herd to run. On the run, it may be possible to separate a slower, weak individual and cut it off from the safety of the group. On this day, there is to be no easy meal. Half of all adult wolves bear evidence of wounds suffered at the hooves and horns of their prey. Young and inexperienced wolves can be seriously injured or killed. But this is neither the first nor last time these particular adversaries will test each other. The next time they meet, conditions may have changed. South of the tundra, the great central plains of the continent begin. A vast prairie seemingly designed for the success of one creature. Adaptable, hardy, prolific, and majestic. Bison. Once these ranges were dark with herds of uncountable number whose existence meant life itself to those who followed their regular migrations, south in autumn, north in spring. The lives of wolf and man converged within the circle of the great buffalo herds. The wolf packs were so much a part of this system that they were tolerated on the fringes of the herds, and so familiar that skilled native hunters wearing wolf skins on their backs could move among the buffalo without provoking a stampede. But this inherent balance, perpetually renewed, never wasteful, was a delicate one. The Native Americans who made their homes on the plains and in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains depended on this animal for almost everything. The buffalo gave them food, hides to cover their lodge poles, clothing, and materials for ornament and armament. The place we now call Idaho was home to the Nez Perce. They had followed the yearly cycle, leaving their river valleys to hunt buffalo on the plains of Montana. Armies from the east changed all that. The Indian people's free occupation of the plains could not be tolerated by a nation bent on dividing and owning territory. Determined to establish farms and ranches to open mines and build cities. So the buffalo was driven to virtual extinction because the Indian nations depended on them. Nez Perce were a people of honor and of deep spirituality. They valued freedom above all else, and when treaty after treaty had been broken by army and government, thunder that rolls in the mountains, who was also called Chief Joseph, began a desperate struggle for survival. With a force that never numbered more than 300 warriors, led by his war chiefs, among them his brother, Alakud, and the Nez Perce War's primary chronicler, Yellow Wolf. They struck and then retreated north for 1,300 miles against overwhelming odds. Just 40 miles short of the Canadian border, they surrendered after the Battle of the Bear Paw Mountains. When the terms of the surrender, too, were broken, more than 400 men, women, and children were delivered to a federal prison, and a way of life died with their captivity. The path was now cleared to divide a land that had never known fences. Sixty million buffalo had been reduced to piles of bones worth eight dollars a ton. Wolf pelts were worth one dollar. By 1888, that price had risen to five dollars, but by then the wolves had gone the way of the buffalo and had disappeared.
Bringing the buffalo back from the brink of extinction is an effort for which there is sympathetic support. The wolf presents a more problematic situation, for the wolf is a carnivore. A wolf pack is a family whose bloodline is established by the lead male and female, the alpha pair. Almost always, they're the parents of the pack members. Their actions will determine the size of the group and how well it survives. The alpha pair breed in February, and the female will try to ensure that this is the only breeding that takes place within the group. This alpha female is searching for a den site. It isn't merely a personal choice, for her decision will determine the disposition of the pack for most of the spring and summer. She may want as many as three dens, perhaps an expanded foxhole, or a den she has used before, or a new den dug specifically for this litter. Whatever site she chooses, they must be close to water, 